Hey everybody, uh, I, we are here, Jamie Heineman, Bill Nye, and I are here talking to David Newman as part of the White House's Astronomy Night. Deputy Administrator of NASA. Great and to be here with you guys tonight. Really great to have you, and I'm actually particularly a little fanboy about this, specifically because you're always, actually this is one of the first times I've seen you not wearing the space suit. <laughs> I'm just wearing a uh, work suit Normal today. human clothes. Right. Um, and you're, the, the, Space suits are for humans. No, I know, but I've never... They're not just not for you. I but mean, I, for I want all the space suits. <laughs> I want to collect yeah. all the space suits. Um, so, what does Astronomy Night mean to you to come here and be part of this? Oh, for us, for NASA, it's just amazing. Be here at the White House, these hundreds of kids here getting inspired and uh, from NASA, we're taking them on our journey to Mars. Actually, it's all the students here are gonna actually be the ones to do our journey to Mars, right? They're gonna be the astronauts, they're gonna be- It's very reasonable, you guys, that the kids that were here tonight are gonna walk on Mars. That's not crazy. We're counting on it. Yeah, somebody. It's really inspiring to walk around and talk to these kids and see the le a level of focus and drive to do what they're doing that I totally did not have at their age. What were you doing? I was, I was building with Legos. Well, that's worthy. Thinking about were girls. they aerospace Legos? <laughs> yes, that's the first start. space. Were they Legos. interferometric Those were Legos. Legos? They were what? You know, interferometry. You know, the kids are all not yet. That. Not yet. Not no, yet. I had secret doors. I had elevators. That's what I had. So I'm wondering whether it's a good idea to send young young people like that because they're going to get like fried by the radiation. You should send old people where it doesn't matter anymore. They could get there's a few people I'd like anyway. to send. So you want to be like one of those guys that volunteered to go fix the Fukushima reactor, knowing that your time was descendant. So yeah, you don't want to send some young kid, you know. It's, uh, well, they won't be yeah. young, though, because we still have until the 2030s to go there. And radiation protection okay. is one of our number one issues. So how are you dealing with that? We're studying it, protecting it, we're mapping, you know, the radiation environment right now on Mars. And it's not going to be in the suits, it, you know, the habitats or even caves. You need to provide a lot of radiation protection. She's nodding her head, you know, caves, Mars, caves. radiation I, I'm protection. In. I'm yeah. in. I'm ready to go. Now, it may be it's very reasonable that the radiation is not as serious as people thought, right? Might be. Is I that mean, really possible? Well, I mean, we'll see what happens with the research, the genetic research, you know, antioxidants, but we'll still have enough radiation protection in place. And um, actually, Dave water, thought of that. water is a great radiation shield. A big, so you need, you need uh, water to thick? drink, right? What is it? Is it about Pretty a foot thick. of water? Good, 12 inches? Yeah, yeah, half a meter, 12 inches or so. So you've got to make And regular, a half if you want dirt, you want, you know, maybe a meter. Okay. So more dirt than, than water, but they're both okay. good well, we protection. Com combine that with the uh, hydroponics that we saw over there, you know, because you're growing plants and stuff, you just line up the dirt and the plants along the outs outside of the, or to your next the, station. the shell. Thank you very much. It's a new sustainable garden, you yeah. know, on the outside and the water. So, so, so the, the safest inside. place to be on Mars is scuba diving then. Scuba diving. Potentially. Potentially. Yeah, I have water there. <laughs> yeah, that's, there's some issues. <laughs> there's some issues. <laughs> want a dry suit. a little suit. salty. <laughs> a little salty. So it is quite reasonable, Dava, that there is enough salt water seasonally every Mars year that there's something alive there, right? It's reasonable. It's, it's reasonable. not crazy. It's, it's extraordinary it's, but not crazy. Right? We knew there was water, ice, right? Now there's water, running water, salty, so it's pretty Shocking. fantastic. Shocking. So my claim is that if we were to discover living things or evidence of living things, it would change the world. It would change the way everybody thinks about what it means to be alive in the cosmos. That's Absolutely. my opinion. And I think it'll frankly, I think in the best way. In yes, the best. It would alter in the best that in, way. Yeah. In the right way. Yeah. Yeah. We'd start asking different questions. Yeah. Yeah. So I understand you designed this suit. I'm, I'm fascinated with that suit. It's like, uh, so it, it, what do you, shrink wrap it on to somebody so it fits perfectly closely? Is yeah, that? you do 3D, 3D laser scans, okay. and then it's mechanical counter pressure. That one, so it's you know, putting the pressure right on your skin. Mm -hmm. uh, the current NASA suits are gas pressurized suits, mm -hmm. and our future suits at NASA are going to be you know, lightweight, mobile. You get to Mars, and you need to be like an Olympic athlete, right? Mm -hmm. Big mountains, you know. Yes, right, right, that's right. what you, you know, need. Deep yes. ravines, yes. and we're there, going there for the search for life. So you, we want to empower them. So mobility, lightweight. So I like to think about, you know, you want the best athletes you can so going and you want to empower them with a really light how, suit. How low a pressure can a human withstand? Like but when you're scuba a, diving, you can take a lot of pressure. From a lot of, because that's high pressure. Yeah. So in space, in a space suit, it's the opposite direction, about a third of an atmosphere. 
So we're here at one atmosphere, mm -hmm. our nice life support system at Earth. So if we give a third of an atmosphere to someone in a pressurized suit, you keep them alive. 300 millibar, 300 hectopascals. Yep, yep. 30, <laughs> 30, 30 kilopascals, I counted. 4.3 PSI, yeah, if we yeah. want, yeah. Oh, PSI, how handy, yes. <laughs> yes, I remember. That's 30 kilopascals, like. yeah. yeah. a third, a third of an atmosphere, yeah. that's easy. That's cool, but you gotta press. You have to press on, is that right? You're, you're a government employee. There you, you go. Get, get back on to our work. Journey, on our journey to Mars. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank Have you, Don. We'll see you, see you so next week. Yeah. Joining us? Yes, yeah, see you soon. See you yes, in San Francisco next week. Nice yes, week. San Francisco. San Francisco uh, you'll Pasadena, be doing California. Yep. yep. Can't wait to see you. Bye -bye. Carry on. Thank you. Carry on. Are you up? Yeah, Yeah, I'll leave. Yes. All right. May, well, May. Great how you to doing? Can I, can Hi, guys. Hello. How are you? Very good. It's good to be here. It's freezing here. I know. Hello. 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 Okay. No, no. We have the amazing May Jemison, astronaut. Hello. 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 Get over without May. falling. Hello. A pleasure. How are you doing? I reached over you to say hi to, to, to a friend of mine earlier in the audience. Uh huh. It's a pleasure to meet you. Hello. How are you? Nice to meet you. We have some questions from from from. So high school students all over the country awesome. have been submitting their questions, uh -oh. and I'm going to try These are and the ah, hard ones. <laughs> here we go. Um, for each of you, what memorable moment would you like to share about your career? Huh? You can go first. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I, I just came to the White House a year ago to be the U.S. Chief Technology Officer, so so you're the I'm Chief the Technology middle. Officer for America. For America, yeah. That's and it's an honor to be working with this president, who is such a science president and uh, we're trying to do things like this event you know where we get more of the American people kids and kids at heart to realize that science and technology is more like this yeah. it's what we do together right. and the exploration and the openness we can learn some facts when we need them but really doing it and exploring is really fun almost like couldn't wouldn't be cool if we could learn science the way you guys do myth busting the way you do amazing missions yeah. and it was more like PE and we play a little and do a little and then we get some instruction, you know, like learning baseball, play a little. Yeah. So I, I love my current job. We work on all kinds of different projects on behalf of the American people, uh, digital government and science and STEM and tech. And so how about you, May? So I'm going to have to go with Megan, too, and talk about my current job, even though some of my past jobs have been pretty cool as well. Amazing. Pretty pretty cool as well. <laughs> so one highlight is, though, because it brings everything together, is the work I'm doing now, which is called 100 Year Starship which is about making sure that we have the capabilities of human travel to another star system within a hundred years. So not a launch, but making sure the capabilities. And the reason why that's important is to be able to create this other perspective, to look at really hard problems and come up with things that will solve them, but will also help us here on Earth. And the reason it's so exciting for me is because you sort of look down the road of when you're traveling, that you've traveled as a child. And I remember looking up at the stars, always assuming I wanted to be a part of it, sort of going down that road, engineering, medicine, all of that, having, working in West Africa, having been a, an astronaut and doing other things. But then this whole piece is sort of like, what can I use my talents on? And this was something I thought would be really important contribution. That is making sure that people get involved. How do we create that commitment that will last for a long period of time, that we don't, um, it doesn't take us, you know, 50 years to do the next yeah. thing, right? That we get to do them because the public stays involved. Well, yeah. so there is often a debate at, around this subject where people are like, why do we need to know about Mars? Why do we need to know about the moon? Why can't we solve problems down here? Can I can tell you. Why exploration is so, so important. So let's, I'm a physician, all right? That's my training. So I always ask people, do you want the physician who has only studied one patient their entire career? Or do you want the physician who's seen many patients? I want the physician who's seen many patients. That's the same thing as we start to learn about the Earth, right? And this planet that we're on. The more we know about other planets, the more we know about the future, the past, the history of our planet and how do we live on it. And then the other part of it is, is that there's all these incredible um, leaps that we make. If we're just doing things that we know we can do, we would never be where we are right now. We would never have the global positioning satellite systems that we walk around with in our head. We would never have certain materials. We wouldn't even probably have as miniaturization to the level that we have now. Weather satellites, I live in Houston. We like weather satellites. Other parts of the country starting to like weather satellites too, right? So those are things that we wouldn't have had if we had not pushed ourselves to do more than we knew we could do. Well, we've also noticed that 
a lot of the most important discoveries that have ever been made weren't things that people were actually looking for at the time. And so, we've noticed that in our yeah. job as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You kind and, of and serendipity. So, you yeah. discover things. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, so, uh, you know, when you embark on some of these searches, there is other stuff that you'll run across along the way that maybe wasn't what you started out with, but actually turns out to be the, the, the real important thing. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Important. So being on that adventure that May's talking about, one of the things I love in the in the sort of slides you have, you show, you know, we if you imagine this is a map of the U.S., you show so far in space we've gone kind of from L.A. a little bit to the suburbs, and what your mission <laughs> you, is um, to get all the way to New York. <laughs> I mean, the equivalent <laughs> right, of that right. distance to, to get to another, uh, to get where you want to go, which is great. So some of the things that come out of um, sort of the work that's going on at OSTP was this this term grand challenge yeah. right so grand challenge is something that galvanizes lots of different disciplines to be able to do something that seems difficult so going to another star is much more difficult than it appears in any of the movies that it's much more difficult than going to Mars or Jupiter so that that map that Megan was talking about, that you just go this little distance, is what Voyager has been doing since 1977, traveling at 35,000 miles per hour. Yep. So to be able to, to go that whole distance to New York, you have to completely change energy. You have to completely change data. Yeah. Right, one of the things we're looking at now is big data. Yeah. What do well, we do with it? You know, oh, with they're growing lettuce here, like how are we going to generate the food on this trip? Yeah. How are we going to? What are we going to make? We have to take everything with us as if we're the starship itself is like a mini planet. For and the I group love that's to, going. to Jamie's point that landing our landing a probe on an asteroid was in some ways it went very wrong, and yet the going wrong taught us so much about yes. the makeup of the asteroid. And we learned a tremendous amount mm -hmm. from what happened to that. Mm -hmm. So um, my son just uh, came out of the Martian film, yeah. uh, which was exciting. <laughs> and uh, I love what he said, because he said, Mom, someday Mars is going to be like Canada. And the Earth is going to be like Ethiopia, where everyone came from. <laughs> and I'm like, you got it, wow. Alex. Uh, but being able to watch, uh, you know, the actors go through debugging, you know, and solving yeah. problems, that's real science, and that's yeah. fun. And we hope that the grand challenges get to be not only part of our adult lives, but also our school lives. You know, and the kinds of science fairs and these kinds of festivals are mm -hmm. much more important. The kids get involved. The United, the United Nations just ratified the Sustainable Development Goals. The global goals, 17 mm -hmm. goals that all of us are working together to end poverty, get gender equality, justice, uh, oceans, etc. And so uh, we, we hosted a solutions summit at the UN where we put up a web page and we asked, we got 800 people around the planet who said things that they already had in progress. Uh, and we had 14 of them come present at the UN, the videos up on the web. But really like thinking about each other as entrepreneurial mm -hmm. teammates who have yeah. great ideas for stuff uh, that we can work together, whether it's for Starship or anything else. Right. And, and I think one of the things you're talking about with science is it's hands-on, right? So as a chemi, right, as a chemical engineer, I would have never have done it if I had to just memorize a periodic table. Yeah. We really need to do the kind of work where it's hands-on. You don't learn coding by pretending to code, right? No. You, you have play to around with code. sensors you have and to internet of things, things. And, and the thing we have discovered toys, is, toys and, first. and kids really like this process, when you look into something deep enough, all of a sudden you find you have your own take on it. Right. You have your own opinion on it, right. all of a sudden now you're super involved and you have something to contribute. Right. Well, children are natural born scientists, right? Yeah. Come out of the chute, picking up the bugs, the snails, looking at it like, what's this? How, you know, the, all, all of it is about experimentation. And so the thing that's really important is that as we go through life as adults, we have to make sure that we don't get rid of this incredible natural construct that children have for learning and that we nurture it and we do that by hands-on education. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And uh, the we third totally grade teacher agree. that my boys have, she says, she has on her wall, in effort, there's joy. And it's in the deep <laughs> effort of doing all this stuff that it's so fun. I see Administrator yeah, Charlie Bolton Peter. over there. Charlie B. Are you coming to join us? Charlie B. Yeah, come on over. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thank you guys awesome so much. Awesome to be here. Thanks for being Thanks. here. Such a pleasure. Thank Keep you. myth busting. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So fun. All right, come on in. Yeah. Okay. All right, let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right.
Hello. Hello, hello. Hello. I'm Judida. Judida, a nice pleasure. Charlie, you. how you doing? Hi, very Hi. good. Hi, nice Hello, to how you doing? I'm warming up just a little bit now. Really? Well, hey, I'm taking my feet it's off the ground. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was doing right jumping here. jacks while y'all were talking. Right? There you go. Yeah. yeah. I am taking yeah. my feet off the ground, though. That's a good yeah. idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wearing three pairs of socks and they weren't It's not working, no. All right, so we have questions that have been submitted by high school students, science interested students from all over the country. And let me see. If we've got something, uh, oh, these are for these are astronomer specific questions. I'm no. an astrophysicist. Okay. She's an astrophysicist. That's for all of them. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You, you get them all. Right all under right. the bus. <laughs> Excellent. Will it ever be possible to grow food on the surface of Mars? If so, how will scientists create an artificial atmosphere that could sustain plant and human life? So we're starting easy then. It's like super easy. Take okay. it slow. Um, I think probably yes we will be ultimately able to grow sustainable life. I mean, I did not say that out loud. <laughs> sustainable food, sustainable food. Um, on Mars. I think that, you know, in just the same way we uh, work to create and reproduce plants and, and stuff in space, I think we'll figure out the right sort of small ecosystem to make that happen. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think it'll be a little farther out than what we do now. Yes. Absolutely, right? It'll take us a little time to do that, but absolutely, I think it'll be possible. So, uh, given that there, there was a process that um, made Mars lose a lot of its, its atmosphere, yes. uh, what is it that we would be able to do that would, you know, be any different than, you know, what, what, why wouldn't it just do the same thing? Is yeah. it by, by small containment? Yeah, I think you'd have about? to, yeah, I, okay. I'm thinking very, very specifically about containment. I don't think it's going to be something that you'd just be able to sort of, without making drastic changes to the planet, uh, I don't think that you're going to be able to just go and grow something. I think you're talking about contained units where you can very carefully curate the humidity, the, you know, sort of metal content, all those things that you need to make something grow, okay. at least at the beginning. And I don't know if you've had John Grunsfeld or anybody over here yet from but 2020 we've got another curiosity like rover that we're gonna launch and land and uh, one of the seven experiments on um, on on 2020 is actually an in-situ resource test where we're gonna try to extract um, what little moisture there is in the Martian atmosphere yeah. and, it'll, and it'll hydrolyze it such that we get hydrogen and oxygen and that'll be the first demonstration that we can produce Right. Uh, you know, life-sustaining uh, material, and I think, as Jediah said, you put it inside some some device, whether it's a dome uh, or something like that, and go for it. Yeah. So we, we we we've been walking around and seeing all these amazing exhibits, and mostly what I'm impressed by is the enthusiasm of these science kids. Yeah. Uh, it's it is something that you know, Jamie and I we meet kids who've grown up with us on their television and they get this deer in the headlight look and then they immediately want to talk to us about stuff we messed up <laughs> and I love that that's a very scientific approach yes. that goes past all the social yeah. whatever difficulty that you might have meeting a, a TV guy TV guys um, what do you guys get out of astronomy night here what, what oh, what's important geez. to you about it? Wow I think the, for me you know being associated with NASA, the most important thing is um, we're always trying to reach young people. And just, um, I, I, I learned something when I first came up here six years ago with the president, and that was um, we always use the term inspire because yeah. that, that's what he talks about. He talks yeah. about inspiring young people. And I had a young uh, president of, the, of an organization called NSBE, the National Society of Black Engineers. And he said, you know, if you talk about inspiring a kid one more time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to puke. <laughs> I said, whoa. I said, well, what would you do? He said, we can't inspire anybody until we expose them yes. to what's available. Right. And so, I mean, we've got kids out here tonight who probably never seen a telescope before. Right. And, um, and you just, you get the excitement. I, I'm not, my granddaughters have a telescope at home, but they don't have anything that's big right. like the ones they're seeing out here yeah. and having somebody who can, because their granddad can't explain anything about a telescope. <laughs> right. But um, I just get excited, you know, this is the second time we've done this, um, and every time when you see these kids come out, 
they just get really excited. And I mean, some of them have come from a long yes, right. way I, to I've be noticed. here tonight. Yeah. yeah. And I think for me, you know, it's it's sort of two things. Because I study astrophysics, that's my career, right? That's what I do. But it's also very much a passion. So to see young people here yeah. that are at about the age I was when I discovered this field, is it's sort of refreshing yeah. and exciting. And it makes me feel like, oh my goodness, the next person is going to be here and they're going to be able to do this. And it's going to be incredible and awesome. Um, I think also about how much so I study black holes I didn't say that but that's what I study and I think of how much that has been amazing for me but also just the experiences the opportunity to be here those things are are definitely enabled by my study of astrophysics so it's not only them getting the sort of scientific you know excitement and looking at Albireo and looking at the moon uh, but it's also how it can change your life if you really and let it. And how much you love it. I, mean, I one love of the, it. We've, we've gotten to deal with NASA a bunch of times over the course of making our show and every single time we deal with NASA engineers they are all polymaths and they're <laughs> scientists who love what we yeah. spend a lot of time yeah. in this country saying you should do what you love and I find that yeah. the group that seems to most consistently do it are scientists. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> It's true. I mean, I think to some extent, you know, in order to really do it well, as you both know, right, you have to persist. You have to love it. Otherwise, you know, the fifth time the thing breaks, you're like, you know what? I don't need this in my life, right? <laughs> but it's the passion that drives you to keep going. Yeah. So that's all the good stuff, though. Like, but some of these kids aren't going to do that. What was it for you yeah. or you that, yeah. that made you stick with it and follow through and actually succeed at it. Is there, is there any, uh, anything that you would have to offer that, uh, that is like, you know, maybe a little different than... Well, it may be that, that science and math are not for, for them. You talk about passion. And every time I talk to students, sometimes I'm talking to engineering students, and I say, you know, one of the things that you'll learn in life is that you can start down a road sometime and you find later on that it's just not the right road for you. Yeah. And it's probably because you're trying to force mm -hmm. something that either your mom or dad said or something like that. I noticed there was a young reporter over here. Yes. And um, she, was, she was as bubbly as any of these kids working with the telescope. But, you know, I think she feels she has a career in journalism. And so she's interviewing the... The, the astronauts right. in the commercial crew cadre and she's got a whole list of questions and stuff so if you talk to my deputy to, to Dava Newman you know she came from MIT and she and I are trying to put the A into into STEAM and uh, because fully on board with a that. student doesn't necessarily know that they like math and science exactly but if we can get them just to come out again if we can just expose them and they may them that, find you know. that that they love it you know and i i use music i don't i'm not a very good musician but i use music as a way to get kids to understand that you know you're you're a, you're an incredible mathematician you're you're already using a different number Same thing system with film editing. you're That's using right. octals right. mm -hmm. whereas i use decimals That's and right. stuff yeah. like that and so we just catch them where they are and and eventually you know i think They'll get, they'll get caught. They will. They will buy something. And I think to get to get, get back to your point as well, you know, I think we have to be careful about how we use the term, you didn't use it, but how we use the term failure when we're talking about these yeah. endeavors, oh, yeah. right? Like to go from, say, a math class to a painting class or to yeah. an, a music class isn't actually a failure, right? Like, and nope. I know you all, all are in the same team with me, but, you know, I think that we have to expand the, the realm of what is okay for students to do. So, you know, if you ask me, well, what do I think about the students that may not make it in STEM? As long as that's not what they ultimately wanted to do, then I'm okay with it because yeah. everybody has a right to find their space. What I'm ultimately most interested in is that every Everyone that wants to has an opportunity. Yeah, and that and that's where I think you really start to get into the how do you do it to do it, but also to Explore. see what's possible. Yeah, exactly. I think we're going to yeah, talk they're to putting some us off. Okay, yeah. all right. Well, this was fun. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. It was, it was lovely great. to meet you. Thanks a lot. All right, take care. Thank you. It's lovely to meet you. You too. All right. Hey, come on in here. Okay. Okay. Hello. Hello. Jamie. Katie Coleman. Eric Bo. Hey, so we were on the space station together. Extra. Actual we astronauts we we've we got. You guys each have, other. have broken the bounds of our planet and lived in space. The view, the view is awesome. I, you know, it's the one, it's the, I, I, I'm a big fan of, of gravity, specifically <laughs> how, the, the, sorry, both like the force gravity, and the movie. Right, right, right. Um, Actually, but, I'm not a fan of gravity. No? 
Oh, wow. Right. Well, no, no, I'm a, I'm a big fan of the movie, yeah, but, but the rest of it, you know, it's... You could take it or leave it? Oh, I could leave it. It's I love funny because it. when I see you in person, I always think that your hair should be doing this. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I tell people it was never in my way because it kind of follows you around, but I think it was in other people's way. I mean, no, Eric and I did I robotics together when we were up there. I was living on the station and Eric came up on the shuttle mm -hmm. and we installed a huge, big module of the space station. And that was a lot of fun. It was totally How long great. were you guys on the station together? Let's say about a week and a half, two Something weeks, like close to that. Yep. Now, what does, we've been asking everybody this, but what does Astronomy Night, what does this mean to you in terms of reaching out to, to, to kids? What, what is the message of Astronomy Night? Well, to me, one of the big things is it just really inspires you to get, get a chance. You realize, you know, sometimes we think we know a lot about the universe, but then when you look out and you realize there's a lot of places we haven't been yet, like we just barely got a, got to the moon, yeah. and then you see all this, the rest of the universe that's left out there to discover. To me, it's, it's inspiring to realize there's so much more that we don't know. It's infinite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and I think that's, like, some kids, you know, think that people who are going to be astronomers, they, they already knew. And they look up and they know this stuff about the stars. And what I think is cool about a, a night like tonight is that, you know, the, the president had to be shown, you know, what where to look and what to see and what you, what he should expect and things like that. Because all of us, I mean, unless you actually are an astronomer, then you don't know this stuff. And so there's a whole bunch of kids that are realizing that here's a bunch of adults on the White House lawn and kids all figuring it out together. And it's okay not to already know. Right. And we we know that people look through telescopes at, at celestial bodies, but it is really inspiring to sit there in this big 8-inch, 10-inch Dobsonian and look at the moon and see the crater. Yeah, I, I haven't ever done that before. I don't know how somehow that escaped my life experience until tonight, but it's amazing to see that. I mean, this used to be the TV of of, of the old days. You know, right. you can imagine that's a lot of people sat around campfires, looked at the stars, and here we are still doing it today. And it's even more amazing when you start looking at the science and the technology that's behind all the, you know, the, all the things that are out there left to, to discover. Now, when you're on the space station, the celestial body you see the biggest is our planet, and it it's fills Huge. your entire view, yes? Absolutely. What, what sort of stuff was the most surprising about first seeing it? Uh, to me, I think the, the neatest thing when you first see the Earth is just the atmosphere. You can see the glow of the blue, and you can really tell the whole Earth is just alive, you know, with life, and that there's something going on on Earth. I mean, you really appreciate how how delicate, you know, it's both big and small, you realize how big the Earth is, and then you realize when you look out in the space, you know, how small we are in the yeah. grand scheme of things. How delicate. How delicate, absolutely. She's Samantha. We have a friend from Italy who just came back from the space station, and, and she says, you know, everybody talks about our fragile planet. I looked back at that thing, and to me, it looked like the Earth was really here to stay. It's not <laughs> fragile. You know, that little layer of atmosphere, that, that yes. is, is fragile, but... It really does. You realize that it's just it's spaceship Earth. And well, all when you of look us. at extremophiles, you realize how tenacious life really is. Mm -hmm. Living in sulfur baths at the bottom of the ocean and volcanic vents, and also in you know in the coldest possible places, that it's, life is everywhere. It's true. Um, I particularly love the enthusiasm of the kids talking about their projects when they when they're telling us about the rockets and telling us about things that they screwed up in the experiment, <laughs> and yet they're they've managed to bring themselves here, to be invited here. It's, it's an amazing, it's really inspiring because I was saying earlier, I didn't have nearly this amount of focus when I was a kid. <laughs> well, uh, given that you two are astronauts, if there was a kid that wanted to be an astronaut, what would you recommend that they do? If, if you had, uh, like, you know, in a nutshell, uh, this is what you need to make that happen. I think it's better always just to follow what you already love to do and, and the, the kinds of things that are that are your passion. Because if you think, well, I should do this, and that way, you know, we, we need to have astronomers up in space, or we need to have mm -hmm. this kind of engineer. And if it's not really what really makes you excited, you're probably not gonna be as good at it. And, and I just think that you should realize that we're gonna need everybody up in space, because we all live in space. I mean, there'll be It sounds like everywhere. you're saying astronauts are kind of nerdy. <laughs> Is that, is, that, is that actually the case? Great and nerdy. Don't, don't, don't let the secret out. It really, to ner totally nerdy in the greatest of ways. How about that? I, I totally agree. I totally agree. All right. Oh, this is cool. <laughs> you All right. Oh, my goodness. You're going to have Polynesian Master Navigator Apprentice, which is the most ancient 
uh, Celestia navigation that we're showing. Absolutely. I was over here learning as about well this. It's fascinating. Another amazing the Polynesians make everyone else look like amateurs when it comes to navigation. navigation. <laughs> That's amazing. They were talking about reaching South Africa today, I think, or yesterday. Yep. Um, oh, really? On yep. a, on a, using the, the technology that they had at the time to actually travel across the oceans. Like Contiki. Right. Wow. That's amazing. Um, sure. All right. <laughs> okay. Hey, Eric, thank you <laughs> nice so to much. See you. Sorry. Can, can talk Good to you? Good to talk to you. Such an honor. Okay. All right, next. Hi. Hello. I'm not sure what to do with this. Hey. How are you doing? Hello. I'm Jenna. Jenna. Is there anybody up there? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Let's see. Ooh, I can hold this up. How's it? Right. We'll hold I'm this Jenna. up. Here. Nice to meet you. Damien? Jamie. 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 All right, so. Sunny. Hello. Hi. Nice Hi. to meet you. Hi. Oh, pleasure. Really nice to meet you. Uh, now, do you need a hand? Can I? No, yeah. I'll, I'll hold this up. Can you tell me what we're looking at here? Uh, this is Hokulea. This is a voyaging canoe from Polynesia, from Hawaii, and we're sailing around the world. And currently we're in South Africa. We just reached South Africa today. Today? Yes. And sailing across thousands of miles of open ocean. Yes, and using traditional Polynesian voyaging techniques. And uh, do way. the Polynesians have really elaborate, extremely exacting star charts to navigate by? <laughs> they just use in their minds, they memorize the universe and they look at nature for answers and that's what we're trying to continue and perpetuate. So it's empirical knowledge that they're using to travel incredible distances across the ocean. Exactly, and we're sailing around island earth looking for solutions to the world's greatest challenges. Yeah, I, I'm, 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 the Polynesian navigation I find completely inspiring. They went to Hawaii, they went to uh, 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 New Zealand. I mean, their, their breadth around the planet from their home base is astonishing when you actually start to draw the circles. It's the largest, I think, nation on Earth when you look at it in all the water that they discovered using these techniques. They were scientists and mathematicians. Amazing. And so this boat just landed on South Africa yesterday or today? Yep. Her name is Hokulea and she just touched Richards Bay and we're going to be in Cape Town in November for Amazing. the arrival ceremony. How many how many people are crewing the boat? Um, there's 12 at a time. We have about 300 crew members from all over the Pacific and international crew members as well. You know, Jamie actually used to be a boat captain in the Bahamas back in his 20s. Wow. In the Caribbean, yeah. Um, navigation is, uh, it's its pretty scary when you think about it, like, uh, with any of these kinds of things. So, taking off, I mean, it's not like you park the boat for the night, you know, and you don't know what's out there, and you run into something in the middle of the night when you're whizzing along, like a rock in the middle of the water. Yeah. It's like, I mean, it's sort of a shot in the dark that uh, literally and figuratively that uh, that you're dealing with um, so it's almost like jumping off a cliff and hoping that you land in the water <laughs> you know? yeah. and you have a really good crew on board always looking out for you yeah. just probably just like the space well uh, Sunia you you're part of the commercial crews for NASA mm -hmm. working with Boeing and SpaceX, SpaceX. Uh -huh. this is a totally new branch of, of I'm gonna yes you can put that down. this is a totally new branch of astronautics uh -huh. as it were. is it is it not absolutely so I, I think what's different about it is we're sort of a, we gave loose requirements to these companies and said, hey, we need a spacecraft that will leave planet Earth and go to the space station. So take advantage of all the technology that we've advanced in the last two, three decades and, and put it in that spacecraft. And then we're, we, as this group of four, um, have, have flown in space, both on the space shuttle and on the Russian Soyuz spacecraft. And so we're, we're go using that experience and going to the companies and seeing sort of what they've done mm -hmm. and comparing it to what we've done in the past. And, and you're giving them advice and uh, consultation. Well, sometimes they tell yeah. us okay enough, but, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, just using our experience to say what, where are the problems that we ran into before and maybe we can anticipate some of the problems that they might have. Um, and it, help them solve some problems. And so it's a very, this must be a, it's obviously a very radically different experience than just working on spaceships that are designed by NASA. Absolutely, because we're, we're involved in the design process. So that's pretty, that's pretty cool. So we get to sort of shape it a, a little bit as much as we can. And uh, like I said, solve some problems. It's like the Polynesians were able to solve some problems together. And the team, teams are huge, you know. It's, uh, you know, our NASA teams as well as both of those companies' teams and getting together. And trying to solve this. And you guys are going to actually 
Are you going to pilot these? You're going to go up to space in these devices? Yes, we are. So that's going to be uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. But I got a lot of tra uh, faith and trust in the companies. You know, of course, they all want to they want to do this successfully. We all want them to do this successfully. Our spouses, if I get home, <laughs> <laughs> my dog even wants them to do it successfully. Yes. So I think they will. They'll they'll do a good job. Yeah. That's very exciting. Yeah, it's, it's very pretty cool. Time. It's pretty neat. What is the projection for the first flight? So I'm, I'm contracted to 2017, so knock on wood, uh, the, that's when we'll be starting to fly. So a little a little bit after you guys probably finished your journey yeah. around the world. You, yeah, is that your goal, to travel all the way around the world? Yeah, 2017 is when we'll be coming home. Awesome, what a so good we'll time. track you guys. Yeah, this is a yeah, perfect likewise, confluence. Yes. <laughs> awesome. I think you should be sailing in to perhaps Florida to watch <laughs> yeah. the first launch. Yeah. <laughs> Luckily, the navigation systems are sort of yeah, very using high the computer, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to be the one out there trying to figure out where we're going. The spaceship will know. <laughs> I'm in the navigation of the, of, the, of the boat. Are there things that they're learning that are that, that the modern day uh, sailors are uncovering that were lost? You know, I think when you look back at the master navigators, they were so in tune with nature. We're just you know, like kindergartners compared to the ancient peoples, all ancient peoples. So it's, it's hard to know what they knew. Um, they had a much deeper level, I think, of understanding the universe. I remember seeing a, a navigational, a Polynesian navigational yeah. chart of currents, and it looked to me just like a bunch of sticks tied sort of randomly. Wow. Yeah. And yet it, that's, a, that's an encyclopedia of ocean currents yeah. over hundreds of miles. Because they knew their place so well. Wow. You know, they studied it every day. And so I think tonight is just about getting kids to look outside and see that nature can tell you how to find your way in, in the world. So interesting, you know, after being up, I was up on the space station for a long duration, as we call it, like six months as our, our increments. And, you know, it's funny, at first you're always like looking at the computer and looking at the map to find out where we are, because we have a thing called world map and it charts where what our orbit is. But after a little while, you know, I mean, just float by the window, like, oh yeah, we're in, over South America. Oh yeah, the, the ocean, there's a lot of ocean, so sometimes that gets a little confusing. But it, it does, it's obvious when it's different seasons. You know, the spring and the fall are a little tough, but when it's winter in the Southern Hemisphere, like, oh yeah, okay, we must be over the Southern wow. Hemisphere, and the currents look like this, or we even oh, were wow. able to see icebergs from space, wow. which was pretty neat. So you start to really understand the planet after, when you make a lot of observations, and that's just in a six month period of time so I can imagine over years and years and years generationally the yeah. generationally um, they they um, they knew what they were doing yes, they did. <laughs> that's astonishing um, have you, have you have you seen any uh, exhibits here from the kids that really inspired you here tonight uh, I've been just running around quite a Me bit too. And back and forth so I need to do a little bit more exploring yeah <laughs> right here on the south lawn <laughs> Well, thank you guys so much for Thanks joining for us and talking us. to us. Yeah, thank you. This has been a lot of fun. Lovely really appreciate it. Nice um, to meet you. I think thank I don't you. think you have to get up. I think we're wrapping up. That's this is astronomy night here at the White House, and uh, we've been talking to a host of amazing heroes, and uh, also we're all incredibly inspired by the kids here. Uh, I just checked. It turns out they're our future. Absolutely. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>